our message this morning, the fourth tabernacle, the fourth tabernacle. You won't understand that until I get into the message, the fourth tabernacle. This has to do with the theme that we're pursuing about our position in Jesus Christ as believers. Now, Heavenly Father, we've come to hear your word. We've never tried or even attempted to entertain anybody in this church. We've come, Lord, to worship and to praise you. We've come to learn about you so that we would be strengthened for our daily life. We can walk with you, O Lord Jesus, in knowledge and wisdom. And we pray, Lord, that you sanctify us, sanctify the word, my lips, my body, this temple of the Holy Spirit. And I pray, Lord Jesus, that you give us ears to hear what the Holy Spirit has to say. Lord, we are so hungry for your word. We delight in your word. Jesus, I come to you now and asking you to give us bread, living bread. Lord, this can't be preached just as theology. It has to be something that you've birthed in our heart. It's something, Lord Jesus, that is real to us. This is truth that sets free. Oh, God, give me the strength. Give me the anointing. And let everyone in the annex and all the overflow rooms and here in the auditorium, wherever it may be, to rejoice in what you are and who you are and what you have brought us to. In Jesus' name, thrill our hearts with your word, I pray. In Christ's name, amen. Now, this message is really about the meaning of the cross of Jesus Christ. This is about the, the ultimate meaning of the cross of Jesus Christ. May I repeat this? We're talking about the fourth tabernacle, and I'm saying to you that it's the ultimate purpose of the cross of Jesus Christ. I hope that by the time I'm finished this morning, when someone asks you, what does the cross mean to you, that you can explain it. There are very few messages I've preached on the cross, I'm sorry to say, over the years, but the Lord's been impressing me more and more that this is what the gospel is all about. We have got to know the ultimate purpose of God in Christ Jesus at his sacrifice on the cross. And that's what the message is actually about. Now, the tabernacle, I call this the fourth tabernacle. Tabernacle means a residence or a home. Yeah, the scripture context it's the place where God abides. It's the place where God lives here on the earth. You say, where is God? He has habitations here, places that he lives, that he abides. Now, the Garden of Eden, where Adam and Eve resided, there was no such thing as a tabernacle. There was no dwelling place. You know the story that the Lord would come down in even tide and he would fellowship. Then he would go back. There, there was no abiding place. He did not live here. He had no place that he would call his residence or his place, though he came for fellowship. You followed all through the scripture. Noah heard the voice of the Lord. But in Noah's day, in that generation, there was no tabernacle. There was no dwelling place. Occasionally, God would speak to men like Noah. He spoke, and for 120 years, Noah seems to have heard no other voice except when God shut him in. And God visited men. God visited Abraham. Abraham spent his whole lifetime looking for a city whose builder and maker was God, a heavenly place. He, he longed, all the prophets longed to see that day, and they saw it coming. Abraham saw my day, Jesus said, and rejoiced over it. He rejoiced over the fact that he saw something coming in the future. Some last generation would enjoy a tabernacle, a place where God would come down on earth and manifest himself, that he would live here on earth. Abraham had visitations, occasional visitations from the Lord. He knew the altar. And such was Jacob. The closest Jacob got to a tabernacle was to see the vision of the ladder with angels ascending and descending. And he said, surely the Lord was here. Doesn't, he didn't say the Lord has made a dwelling here. The Lord visited. Surely the Lord was in this place. He knew the altars, did Abraham. He, he knew occasional fellowship. 
but he could, there was no place he could go to worship. There's no place he could say, God is here or God abides here. The first tabernacle, number one, the first tabernacle was raised up by Moses. Exodus 25, 8. God said, make a place, a sanctuary that I may dwell among you. Erect a sanctuary, a tabernacle. I can come and dwell in your midst. And there I'll meet with you. I'll commune with you from above the mercy seat. God himself designed this first tabernacle. Now, it wasn't much to look at. If you looked at it from a mountaintop, perhaps, all you would see was a box-like structure with badger skins over it. And then you saw a wall around it with an inner court, and it was a sandy court. And there was nothing to look at. There was no beauty about it. Now, this was a type of Jesus Christ. And Isaiah the prophet said there's no beauty in him that we should desire him. Moses was instructed on every detail. There was nothing in that tabernacle that said, oh, this was my idea or I thought of this. Every detail, every socket, everything in that tabernacle that was erected was under the direction of God himself. God said, no flesh, I won't abide where any flesh is in authority, where any ideas of men exist. I will come only where I am in full control, where everything is according to my divine order. I will not inhabit any sanctuary unless it's according to my prepared prescription, so to speak. Every detail. And so you find it said in Moses did as according to the word of the Lord. And Moses did according to his word. Thus did Moses according to all that the Lord commanded him. So he did. God had a plan. This tabernacle was to represent in typology the Lord Jesus Christ. He in the Holy of Holies. He is the altar. He's the sacrifice. He's the golden candles. Like everything was in a tabernacle was some aspect of the reality and, and the, uh, re, the power and authority and the absolute meaning of who Jesus Christ is. Now, the first tabernacle lasted for 400, about 480 years and passed away. It was not a permanent tabernacle. The Lord had a time where he visited men and there was a manifestation in that tabernacle. You could say God is there. Every Israelite say, where is God? He's in his temple. He's in his tabernacle. And the manifestation of God's presence was a cloud by day and a fire by night. He manifested. That was the house. That was the place where God dwelt. He said, I'll meet you above the mercy seat. 480 years, God dwelt in that tabernacle and passed away. The second tabernacle was raised up by Solomon. The scripture says, uh, or, or, this was in David's heart. David was given the burden of vision to erect a tabernacle or a temple unto the Lord. David said, isn't it time that there should be in Jerusalem, the chosen city, a palace or a dwelling place for the Most High God. And the scripture says God gave him every detail, every detail of it. I read it to you. David said, he was speaking to Solomon because God forbid that David build that tabernacle. It was given to his son Solomon. David said to Solomon, the Lord made me understand in writing According to his hand upon me, even all the works or details of this pattern. He showed the plans for the temple, the tabernacle that Solomon would build. And he told his son, now, I got this from God. Every detail, every stone in its place, every piece of furniture, of the gold coating the pillars and the carvings, the brass labor, everything in detail and in measurement I got from the Holy Spirit. I got it from God. And there was nothing he could say, well, this is my plan. This is what 
came to my mind. This is my idea. There was not a single idea or concept of David in it. Again, God says, I will not dwell where flesh tries to produce something holy. I will not deal where man tries to take control and say, this is God. He said, you can take it for granted. You can take it as a law of heaven. I will not inhabit anything except as according to my divine will and my divine order. And God manifested his presence in that house because it was according to his mind. Now, of course, you know that there was not a sound made when they built the temple. There was not a hammer. There was not a sound. It was all detailed. Every stone had been measured at the quarry. Now, if you go to the quarry and you go to Lebanon where they're cutting trees, 10,000 men a month, you would have hear, heard the saws going and you would have heard the, the hatchets that were splitting the wood and turning it to lumber. You would have heard the sound of many men and you go to the quarry, you would have heard the hammers and you would have heard the files and you would have heard the saws. There was noise because God was preparing it. Folks, some of us are in the quarry right now. Some of you know what it's like to be chiseled. Some of you know what it's like to be cut down and wonder what's happened and yet God's making something out of you. He's preparing you for a temple. And you wonder sometimes what the noise is all about and what the trial is all about. And Lord, why do you prune and why do you cut? Because he's putting you, he's building you, preparing you for the fourth tabernacle. The fourth tabernacle is coming. And you and I are now sometimes in the quarry. We are in that Lebanon wild, well, uh, that Lebanon forest. And the saw comes and the Lord cuts it down. It seems like all life, the source of life, my roots, everything. Lord, you're cutting me down. Yes, and he's not only finished when he cuts you down. Then he comes and slices you up <laughs> into lumber. But he has a purpose. He's going to, you're going to be placed in, he has the numbered position. He's going to place you in his body. You are placed in his body at a, he knows exactly where it goes. The chief architect knows where every piece of lumber goes, where every stone is placed. And then he's going to cover you with gold. That's the tabernacle of Solomon when everything was in place. The Bible said when the priest came out ministering, they could not stand because the glory of the Lord descended upon the tabernacle. The cloud of glory because it was all in divine order. Now that tabernacle, that temple existed for 500 years. For 500 years, you, it, it, anybody, now I want to tell you something. This was confined to a certain place. The first tabernacle was confined to one isolated place in the wilderness. It was moved about. But it was for only Israel. The heathen were not allowed to worship. They were not even allowed to enter. They could not make the sacrifice there. This, this was a strictly, you had to go into the wilderness. You had to go where it was. And if anybody in any other part of the world, any Jew say, where is God? Well, he's in the wilderness. You have to go there. And so with Solomon's temple, if you wanted to know where God was. If you wanted to know, according to the Jews at that time, they could have been in Asia, they could have been in Europe, they could have been anywhere on the face of the earth, but they prayed toward Jerusalem, they looked to Jerusalem because they, that's where God was. Daniel prayed, all of the, the Hebrew children prayed, they faced Jerusalem because that's where God was, they said. That's where God abides. But it was in an isolated particular place for t particular people. And though the glory of the Lord was there, that temple was destroyed. It passed away. Now I've talked to you about two tabernacles. And then came the third. Now folks, when I talk about tabernacle, I'm talking about that which God approved. The temple, of course, they rebuilt Solomon's temple. 
It's still the same temple on the same foundation. But even though Herod built a temple, that was not the temple during the time of Christ. The third tabernacle was Jesus Christ himself. Jesus was the place where God dwelt. It's very clear in the scripture. In him dwelt all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. The word, the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. The word dwelt is tabernacled. He came down and he tabernacled among us. He was the temple of God. God existed. God lived in his son. He was God in the flesh. But God manifested himself through the son. God manifests through the son, the Bible says. Jesus himself. He said, you tear down, speaking to himself, of himself, you tear down this temple and I'll rebuild it in three days. He was saying, I am the temple. I'm going to be crucified and I'm going to be raised on the third day. I am the temple. If any man thirsts, let him come to me. Now, Jesus walked Jerusalem streets. And when Jesus was there, you could walk up and down and you see the Jews flocking to the temple of Herod. And that's where Moses was preached. The law was preached. That's where they sang the songs of David, the Psalms of David. That's where they sacrificed the blood sacrifices and all this religious activity. And God didn't recognize it. He called it a den of thieves. And every Jew said, this is where God dwells. They walked in there. They were confident that behind that curtain, behind that veil, There was God. God was in there. They didn't know who he was. They had no real relationship to him. But somehow this mysterious thing called a vapor or something, God is in there. Don't go near there. But God was not there. God was in Christ. He was the temple of God. He was the third tabernacle. Hallelujah. Jesus manifested forth his glory and his disciples believed in him. Now that brings me to the cross. I told you this is about the cross of Jesus Christ. Now what is the true meaning? Why did Jesus suffer and die? And why? What is the offense of the cross? Let me start there. The offense of the cross is that Jesus went about saying, I, I am the temple. I am the manifestation of God. God is in me. If you see me, you've seen the Father. And he, they had overheard him teaching his disciples that he's going to come again and he's going to raise up, uh, he's going to raise up a church. And, and he says, I, you won't see me for a while, but I'm coming back and you'll see me again. The disciples were taught, though they didn't completely understand it, that the Lord was going to establish his name throughout the world. And this is the offense of the cross that to the religious Jew and to the priest, that they really are not going to get rid of him, according to what Christ was teaching. This would not be the end of him. There would be all kinds of tabernacles raised up. There would be all kinds of temples all over the world. Because you see, The cross of Jesus Christ, if I ask you, what do you think of the cross? The first answer I would hear is, well, certainly he died to remove the transgressions of sinful men. He died for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. Yes, thank God for the cleansing blood, the power of the blood. You say it's for our healing, for by his stripes we are healed. Yes, that's the meaning of the cross in essence. That's, that's one of the meanings of the cross. That's why you and I are here. One day, God looked at you and you didn't choose him. He chose you. He chose me. Not because you were good, not because you cleaned up your life. But God, by his own merit, by his own love, looked at you and said, I want you. I choose you. Then he sent the Holy Ghost and he sent his word to you. And the Holy Ghost opened up that word and you responded to that word. 
And when you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, he wiped away your sins so that you can sit here this morning and say, I'm clean, I'm clean, I'm under the blood. And you have every right to enter in and say, by his stripes we are healed. I stand here on the strength that I receive from the blood of Jesus Christ. Yes, he died for the sins of men. He died to heal men. He died to reconcile us to God. You say, well, isn't that enough? What more is there in life than to be saved and know I'm ready for heaven? Well, folks, there's such a thing as living here until he comes. There's such a thing as being his testimony until he comes. At the cross, Jesus Christ raised up the fourth tabernacle. What is the fourth tabernacle? You and I represent the fourth tabernacle and the last tabernacle, the last dwelling place of God on this wicked earth. Because, you see, it's more than just being forgiven. I've been trying to say that now. This is the third week. There's more to this cross than just being forgiven. It's more than just being granted eternal life. More than divine healing for body, soul, mind, and spirit. That is glorious. That's the gospel. But there is so much more, and if we miss it, all we're going to do is sit around saying, Lord, thank you for saving me. Now keep me and get me out of here as soon as you can. And you can sit and go through life with a generation going to hell and say, well, I know I'm saved. And I'm on my way to heaven. Thank God for paradise. But God says, I want to dwell with you now. I want to live in you, and I want to bring heaven down to you, and I want to seat you in the heavenly place that is in this heart. I told you last week, you don't go out of this earth. You don't go into the cosmos to get to the heavenly place. When Jesus died, he opened up the way. He was the foundation stone, the Bible said, a true, tried, precious, costly stone. And for 4,000 years, Christ, who was in God from the foundation of the world, was laying a foundation upon which he would build a church, the Holy Ghost Church of the last days, that which every prophet desired to see, that which Abraham saw and rejoiced over. Even Moses said, he will raise up a prophet like unto me. They all saw it and never enjoyed it, never entered into the glory of it. But you and I have been blessed. You and I live in that day because at the cross of Jesus Christ, when he said it is finished, it was not Jesus saying, well, God, get me out of here. I've finished your work. Take me home. No, 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 no. Bible said he endured The cross and despised the shame for the joy that was set before him. And what was the joy that was set before him? It was that when he was on this earth, he could be at one place. He could communicate with just a handful. He was never in Europe. He was never in Greece. He was never in the rest of the world. And he loved the world. God loved the whole world, all mankind. And now Jesus says, I want you to take me back to the glory that I had with you from the beginning of the world. And what was that glory he wants? His omnipresence. Now, after the cross, I'm not just in Jerusalem. I'm in Greece. I'm in Holland. I'm in the whole world. When he said, it is finished, he said, the stone is in place. Now I can build. Now I'm going to have a people. And I'm coming back in spirit. I'm coming back. And everyone who believes in me, and everyone who looks to this cross, I will come and abide in him. And he becomes my house. He becomes my tabernacle. You and I are the fourth tabernacle. Do you see it? 
then why don't you have your hands up and say, thank God, Jesus lives here. God lives here. Do you remember the Samaritan woman who came to Jesus at the well of Jacob and he said to Jesus, she said, you, in other words, you Jews, say that Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. In other words, we're, we're told that you have to go to Jerusalem. That's where God is. And Jesus, looking forward to the cross and knowing what was coming, turned to the woman and said, Woman, believe me, the hour comes when you shall neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father, but the hour cometh and now is. Hallelujah. When the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship Him. God is a spirit. They that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. And what He's saying, no, the time's coming. I'm building a church. You don't have to go to Jerusalem. You don't have to go some isolated place. I come to you. He said, you obey me. He said, you obey my commandments and I will come and my father will come and we will make our abode in you. We will make you our tabernacle. You will make, we will make you our dwelling place. You've been prepared as a habitation of God, the scripture says. Go to Ephesians 2, please, quickly. Ephesians, the second chapter, and I'll prove that to you. Ephesians 2. Let's start at verse verse 16. That he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. And he came and preached peace to you which were far off and to them which are near. Nigh. For through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. Now therefore you no more strangers and foreigners. You remember what, what the scripture says of Abraham? He, he, he sojourned as a stranger and an alien. But you see, we don't sojourn on this earth as aliens. We have been brought in. We are his tabernacle, it says. Now we are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. And we are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets and Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. That's when he said it is finished. He was put in place, the Father, in whom he also are builded together for what? A habitation of God. That's tabernacle. A tabernacle of God through the Spirit. Is it in your Bible? God all this time has been preparing you to be his abiding place. If anyone in New York says, where is God? Don't point to this building. Don't say 51st and Broadway. Somebody says, where is God in New York? Just raise your hand and say, here he is. He abides in me. This is the temple of the Holy Ghost. You are building together for habitation of God through the Spirit. If any man love me, he'll keep my words and my father will love him and he will come. We, we will come unto him and we will make our abode. We will dwell in you. Oh, what a mind boggling truth. God, father, God, son, God, Holy Ghost lives in me that I and you are the temple of the Holy Ghost. Don't come to church expecting God to show up somehow. Don't come saying, I hope the preacher stirs me and God does something in my heart. I want to hear a new truth. I want to hear some special revelation from God. I hope we can sing and shout and have a great time because I want, I want to meet God. You should bring God with you. You're supposed to bring him into this house. I, I can't give God to you. I can give you his word, but I have to come to this pulpit having been shot.
been with him in my temple, praising and worshiping, getting the anointing, getting a revelation. And so with you, everyone hearing me, you should get your revelation. You are the temple. You say, well, I don't feel like a temple. I don't look like a temple. Well, if you looked at the old tabernacle in the wilderness, it didn't look like much. But I'll tell you, God was there. And the only thing, listen, Solomon's temple, as beautiful as it was, God was not in the wood. He was not in the stone. He was not in the gold covering. He was in the mercy seat. He was in one place. And, folks, it's not in the building. It's not in anyone around you. It's you. It is me, a corporate body under one head. Many members, one body. Hallelujah. To put it simply, <laughs> the many houses of worship, many temples, one denomination, Jesus Christ and Him crucified. We're all part of one body. A, a, a body simply means a group of people designated under one idea or concept. It's just a body of people that all think alike, that all dwell alike under one headship. That's Jesus Christ himself. The scripture refers to our body as a house. In other words, dwelling place. Paul spoke of our earthly house of this tabernacle. He said, right now, this house is a tabernacle. One day, He says, we're going to have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. One day you're going to get a new body. But as long as you're in this body, I don't care how frail it is. I don't care how sick you are. I don't care what you feel. I go by what the Word of God says. And if you believed on Jesus Christ and you made Him Lord of your life, God is there. God abides. He's there. You don't have to scream at Him like I'm screaming now. You, you don't have to raise him from the dead. The word is nigh you, even in your mouth. The Lord is here. He, he has his voice of the Holy Ghost. For we in this tabernacle or this house do groan, being burdened. But he said, this treasure, this treasure who is Christ is in earthen vessels. Yes, even frail ones. Christ is a son over his own house. Whose house are we if we hold fast the confidence and rejoicing of the hope steadfast or firm to the end? He said, you are my house. If you want to do you want to understand what God is saying? If you hold fast the confidence with rejoicing to the end. I I have to illustrate. I'm going to make this as simple as I possibly can. Folks, when, when I thought of this, I, I just started weeping and raising my hand, walking around the house saying, thank you, Jesus, because I'm so simple-minded. I don't understand some of the deep things of God, but this I have to understand. And the Lord brought to my memory a true story, a man I know. He, 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 he was an executive, a high-paid executive in a corporation, lived in a million-dollar house. And I witnessed to him a number of times, <clears throat> and uh, he became an alcoholic, and he lost his job, he lost his career, he lost his wife, and just stayed in the house drinking. Now, he loved that house, he designed it, he furnished it, he loved it, and he said, he, he told me, in fact, he said, I'll never leave it, I will never give it up, this is my house. Now, Jesus calls us a house. We're the house of God. And and this man would would just drink all night. In fact, his garage, these these big cases of whiskey and and, uh, all kinds of deadly drinks, vodka, mostly vodka, get stone drunk and sit in that house, start drinking as soon as he got up and drink all day long. But you see, he loved his house. He said, this is mine. I'll never leave it. But he couldn't keep up with the mortgage payments. 
And the time came when he, he was forced. And a new owner came and purchased it. He paid off the debt, completely paid the debt of the house. Most of the money went just to pay off the man's debts. I don't know if he came out with anything, but papers were signed. They were registered at court. And the, the deed was registered. The man had, uh, had been forced to sign the papers. <clears throat> but he said, I'm not leaving. I'm not going. Locked himself in the house. And, he, and, and, and uh, you know, I would go past that house and I think, and this, this man has is, is lost it. He's in delusion. In fact, when he did go out, he was telling everybody, I don't care what the law says. I am not leaving. It's my house. Now, the house had already, the deed was already registered in court. Legally, that man's dead. As far as the law is concerned, regarding that house. He can't touch, he can't touch it, he can't go back and live there. But he's there, he says, I'm not going to leave. And so they had to call in a deputy. And the deputy, the deputy literally bodily evicted him. Now that, that that man's evicted, and the new owner went in and <laughs> took all the furniture was removed, and the house repainted, and the people moved in. And and this man still driving up and down the road saying, "It's my house. It's my house." You get the picture. You get the picture. See, because of the Adam nature in us, because of our proclivity to sin, self-will, we, we are born with this self-ambition, this self-need, self-place, everything with self, self, self. And in this, the devil took a jump claim on the house and he said, this is mine. And he moved in and he furnished it. And so you lived in a house with a devil guest. Who stole your birthright, who stole your property, and he put his name on the deed. But you see, the debt began to pile up, and Jesus, this man cries out, and we, we cried out one day, Jesus came on the scene and he paid the debt, and he put the deed in his own name, and it was registered in the highest court in the universe. And as far as the law is concerned, the devil is evicted. He's cast out because God sent his deputy, the Holy Ghost. And the Holy Ghost looked the devil in the eye and said, you're dead. You don't own this place. This place is owned by God the Father. This is a Holy Ghost house. This is the church of Jesus Christ now. And new owners, new owners are moving in. But the devil says, I decorated it. I painted the walls. It's my taste. The Holy Ghost said, no, it's going to be repainted and refixed. The devil doesn't leave quietly. The Holy Ghost has to take him by the nap of the neck and cast him out. And that's what the Bible said. He put into an open shame and prevailed over him. You say, well, why am I being harassed? Oh, that's the devil walking back and forth. He's saying, that's still mine. I'm going to get back in. You've got a deed registered in heaven. You've got a deed. The 
that's what Paul is saying. You're my house. If you continue in faith, unafraid of the devil, because legally he's dead. According to the law, he can't touch you. Because everything that was under judgment died at the cross. All my past sins. Well, say, yeah, but he's going around telling lies, telling everybody he still owns a house. Let him lie. Doesn't mean anything. Oh, but somebody said, yep, he threw a stone through my window. The Holy Ghost is a fixer-upper. Hallelujah. He said, you are my house. You're my fourth tabernacle, the last tabernacle. The tabernacle that is next is in glory. But he says, now, you're in the flesh, but you are mine. And if you will hold to that truth, don't let it go and begin to rejoice in your security. Rejoice. The devil has no authority, no power. Oh, folks, don't be afraid of the enemy. He can't touch this house. He can't hurt you. And the only way he can be successful is if you believe his lies. I'm going to close with this. But when I was in Norway recently, now Norway has a king. And the hotel I was in, right across the river, there's a palace. And, and there's a flagpole on top. The same with Windsor Castle in London. The King of England, King and Queen of England. And f- for the first three, four days, there was, there was no flag on the pole. The king's insignia or ensign was not there. The standard, they called the king's standard, was not there. One day, I came out of the hotel and the flag was waving. I, I turned to him, what, what's that mean? He said, that means the king is there. He's in residence. What's the Bible say? When the enemy comes in like a flood. Wait a minute. You say, wait a minute. Devil, you going to come after me like a flood? You better look up. The king is there. The king is there. The flag. I'll raise up a standard against him. Stand. Raise your hands. Say, thank you, Jesus. The flag. The king is in residence. The king is in residence. He said, rejoice. We rejoice in our place in you, Jesus. We rejoice in you. We glorify you, Lord. We magnify you, Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. All hail King Jesus. All hail Emmanuel. Where is the King? He's in your heart. He's in my heart. He rules. Say it out loud. The king is in residence. The king is in residence. I want to give an invitation quickly to those in the auditorium and those in the overflow rooms, wherever you may be. Now, there's some of you here that cannot rejoice this morning. Even though you may try to enter in, there's something. There's a controversy. There's something going on in your heart and your life. And you know things are just not right. Now, You may be harassed by the enemy. And folks, the devil's a liar and the father of all lies. But there are some of you this morning that really need a cleansing. You need to be clean because the the world has intruded in your life. Something has happened. And I want you to step out of your seat. I want you to come only because you say, there's something in my heart yearning 
to be so clean before the Lord. You come to the blood. You come now to the love of God. You come to the cross. And you say, I want to be a dwelling place for God. I want to know that I can look at the whole world. I can look at my family. I can look at, and they can know God lives in me. Christ is in me. I live it, not I be Christ is living. Get right out of your seat. Let me pray for you here in the annex. Go to the lobby. Just go to the lobby. Ushers will show you how to get into this building. Come down the stairs and come here and meet me up in the balcony. Go to the stairs on either side and come here. We're going to pray and believe Jesus to touch you, cleanse you, and let you walk out of here clean. Oh, isn't it wonderful to know that you're clean before God? There's nothing hidden. Nothing hidden. No hidden thing in your life. That's what God wants for you. Very quickly, let me speak just a few words to those of you who have come. <clears throat> I'm, I'm always thrilled to know that it doesn't take God long. You don't have to struggle with him. He's more willing to give than you and I are to receive. And he said he's, he's anxious to forgive willing to forgive, delight, delighting in his forgiving power. He delights in forgiving and cleansing. All you have to do behind your word, behind your confession, there has to be a heart. It says, Jesus, not my will now. I want to give you control of my life. Send the Holy Ghost. Inhabit me and then rule my life. Will you pray this prayer with me right now? Lord Jesus, thank you. For loving me. And this morning, I come to you in faith like a child wanting forgiveness and cleansing. You said if we confess, you'll forgive and cleanse us. Make us clean from all sin and unrighteousness. By faith, I receive that. By faith, I believe my sins are forgiven. Now, O oh God, fill me with the Holy Spirit. I open my heart to the Holy Spirit. And give me the cleansing power, the sanctifying power of the Holy Ghost. Clean up this house and abide in me. Live in me. Let me know your presence. Let me experience your presence and become the joy of my heart. I'm going to pray for you now. Father, in Jesus' name, we ask for our minds and our understandings to be opened by the power of the Holy Ghost. We pray, Lord, that we begin to see that God said that when you come to him ready to obey, he would give the power to obey. He would give the desire to obey. He would give the will to obey. Lord Jesus, open our eyes to realize that no matter how we feel, you possess us. You come and live in us. And we become the temple of the Holy Spirit. Oh, God, we come against the lies of the devil. Devil, you have no rights now. You have no power. God, you've come down and you purchased. You said you're not your own. You're bought with a price. The blood of Jesus. Lord, everything is forgiven.